My name is Michael McFall. I'm the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Uh, welcome back to our Friday at One seminar series. Uh, we discontinued it uh, over the break. And then there were events in America, um, uh, especially on January 6th, where we thought we had to get back into the game. Last week, we had a terrific panel talking about the future of democracy and the consequences of the events on July 6th for what they meant for the future of democracy. And today we're gonna to be continuing that conversation with the special piece of that in many ways, I think one of the most fundamental questions for the future of American democracy and frankly, for the future of democracy around the world. Our event today is called the storming of the Capitol and the future of speech online. Um, and we, uh, as we did last week, the Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law was our basic host. Today, the host uh, of a really all-star panel, by the way, is the Cyber Policy Center, one of the seven centers that we have at FSI. Uh, you all maybe have been thinking about these issues uh, recently a lot, uh, but you're gonna hear from people today that have literally been thinking about these people, these kinds of issues for years. Uh, we only have an hour together today um, and we are taping this and it'll be up on our website. Uh, for those that couldn't join us, please advertise that fact. But before I hand it over to Kelly Bourne, the executive director of the Cyber Policy Center, who will be moderating the discussion today, I wanna strongly encourage you to go to their website. Uh, uh, there is just a ton of material that has been produced uh, from all of the different programs within the Cyber Policy Center. And I really encourage you to deep, dig deeper into that written and published and video work that is all there uh, uh, after today's events. So with that, uh, let me now hand it over to Kelly, as I said, our Executive Director of the Cyber Policy Center, and will moderate what I think is an absolutely all-star panel that we have uh, lined up for you today. Great, Mike, thank you so much. And I am really glad to be joined today by four of our colleagues, Nate Persley. He is the faculty co-director of the Cyber Policy Center and the director of the Program on Democracy and the Internet here at the Center by Daphne Keller. She is the director of the Center's Program on Platform Regulation. And before that was the former Associate General Counsel for Google. We're joined also by Alex Stamos the director of the Cyber Center's Internet Observatory and the former chief security officer at Facebook, as well as his colleague, Renee DiResta, who is the research director at the Internet Observatory, a fellow at Mozilla and the Truman National Security Project and a term member at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, quickly, before we jump in, just a bit of background on the center as Mike began to allude to, and for those of you who don't know us, all of our research and teaching focuses on the governance of digital technologies, and their impact on geopolitics, security, and democracy. We're home to about a half dozen programs, and all of the work is really intended to inform the policy agenda for governments, tech companies, civil society, and academia globally when it comes to these questions of how best to govern digital technologies. As Mike noted, today's conversation focuses on the storming of the Capitol and the events of January 6, the role that the tech companies played in that, everything that has transpired since, and the implications that this may have for the future of speech online. And of course, as everyone joining today knows, when the US Capitol was breached on January 6, more than 50 police officers were injured and five people died and social media platforms were involved for better or worse at every stage of this through the viral sharing of allegations that the election was stolen that appeared on all major platforms uh, as groups organized online, planning travel, restaurants and hotel arrangements and messaging each other about everything from ropes to zip ties that we saw on these platforms. And the events of course of January 6th were recorded and shared widely on the platforms. In fact, actually helping to enable later identification and prosecution of the perpetrators. And of course, the platforms responded significantly since then. Facebook, Twitter, Google, and other major platforms banned or suspended President Trump's accounts. Google and Apple then removed Parler, a conservative leaning app from their app stores, and Amazon removed the site from its cloud hosting services, putting really an indefinite end to Parler's reach. And the responses to that have been widespread. Conservatives began noting how many followers they were losing as Twitter purged accounts. Groups began reporting that disinformation had dropped 
online with MSNBC citing a 73% decline in disinformation the week after Twitter banned President Trump and key allies. And of course, this citation has been widely disputed given that Twitter suspended something like 70,000 accounts during that time period, not just Trump allies. And then finally, we've seen the online far right beginning to move underground. Downloads of Rumble, the, the rights equivalent to YouTube, more than doubled in the week following January 6th. MeWe, a conservative parallel to Facebook, saw its base growth 3x. CloudHub, uh, something like five times growth. Downloads of Telegram doubled. Signal was up 8x. And uh, we've heard recently that Gab's user base rose uh, from 1.5 to 3.4 million that they are now hosting themselves. So a ton has changed. And I think all of this will have significant implications for the future of speech online. So for today, I wanna to turn first uh, to Renee and Alex uh, to hear from each of you about what activity you saw on the platforms leading up to the riot, what, if anything, we've been able to observe in terms of political disinformation online since then, given that these groups have been uh, moving underground and, and what you think the future holds for political disinformation. Um, so want to start Renee with you, then go to Alex and then want to turn from there to Daphne and then finally Nate and Daphne and Nate as legal scholars would love to hear your thoughts about lawmakers real options here, how these intersect with constitutional limits, thoughts on 230 and all of that. Uh, and then we'll save 20 or 30 minutes for Q&A. So please, uh, folks who are joining, feel free to enter your questions in the chat box. There's a function where you can up or down vote those uh, for those questions that you're most interested in, and I will do my best to moderate. Uh, but with that, Renee, let's jump to you. Hi, uh, thanks so much. It's great to be here. And I think this is a really important topic. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a, a framing as we as we try to understand what happened. And there's a question of, um, you know, I got asked by a lot of media folks who were reporting on the events, uh, how did we get here? Right, and, and that, that's, I think, the question that everybody wants an answer to. How did we reach the point where uh, groups of Americans actually chose to breach the Capitol in response to a massive uh, belief that the election is stolen? And this is a really interesting question because depending on which time horizon you're inclined to go back to, uh, you can answer it differently. So I would say in the very long term, there's the issue of uh, echo chambers and polarization and how those structures form. Um, how the networked groups that participated in both the rally and the march, and those are two actually distinct things, and there were a range of different groups that were there. There were militia members and people who were kind of avowed uh, white supremacists and others who have been in existence prior to Trump and, and will continue to, uh, to act, you know, in, in the current administration. Uh, there were the there's the kind of mainstream pro Trump supporters who support the president for one reason or another. Uh, then there was the QAnon community, which is a distinct subset that has very conspiratorial beliefs. So this is not one um, one faction, if you will. This was multiple factions that came together. And so there's a need to understand ways in which uh, network activism online manifests and ways in which these factions form. And the increasing prevalence across the entirety of the political spectrum, not only in the US, but globally, uh, of how factional activism manifests and the ways in which these ties uh, form. Um, so that's the sort of long term time horizon view of how we got here. In the medium term, though, we can talk about the campaign and we can talk about the work that we saw as part of the election integrity partnership, the uh, kind of interinstitution collaboration that we had here at Stanford and with other partners. And in the medium term, the reporting that we did through EIP was really documenting a highly divisive campaign marked by lies and half truths and misleading framings. And there was this repetitive process that we saw over and over again for months in which an incident was a real, an, an incident that was documented, it really happened in the world, was recast as part of a broader narrative. And then sometimes those narratives were additionally recast into the realm of conspiracy. Uh, meaning they were attributed to some sort of dark force that was responsible for uh, affecting the action that that, uh, that was being alleged. So to use a specific example, a ballot in a dumpster um, was taken out of context. Maybe the ballot, you know, as, as we saw with some of these cases, they were actually the envelopes for the ballots, but that didn't matter. What mattered was somebody snapped a photo of it. This was documented as an incident. The incident was woven into a narrative of massive fraud. And then occasionally there was a, an additional layer that was added on where someone somewhere was responsible for that massive fraud. And that maybe it was the deep state, maybe it was the Democrats. There were a variety of different bad guys that those things were attributed to. But this was a very repetitive process. And what it served to do was 
for people who occupied certain echo chambers, this was what they saw over and over and over again, constant repetition of these claims, these narratives, ways in which, uh, you know, we, we called them repeat offenders, ways in which very prominent influencers consistently put out the message uh, that this was happening, that the election was stolen. And so when the president's loss, when President Trump's loss manifested, they were primed to believe that this was the result of a massive steal. And if you believe that your vote has been stolen and your candidate has had the, you know, his his win, um, you know, taken from him, um, that generated just extraordinary amounts of anger. And beginning on election night, we started to see protests at capitals around the country or at voting facilities. You know, people would show up with uh, Sharpie markers and occasionally long guns to rally outside of a particular polling place, alleging that Sharpie markers had been used to to take their votes and uh, and and render them. Uh, uncounted. So this process not only happened on social media, there were also broadcast media elements that came into play here. And there were influencers, you know, very prominent folks, uh, Senators Ted Cruz and, and Josh Hawley, for example, uh, you know, perpetuating this idea that the election had been stolen. So as we get to the question of how did we get here, we have to take into account the rising anger and the narratives that were manufactured in that period. And then what happened on January 6th, this is where we get to the question of to what extent uh, could we have known and observed and, and seen the rhetoric ratcheting up these claims as Kelly has referred to with things like, um, you know, packing your zip ties and your and your weapons and whatever else, um, really the increasing calls for overt violence that, that did begin to manifest on social platforms, uh, which was again, very much sort of a short term thing. And that happened not only on the mainstream platforms, which were taking steps to try to tamp it down and um, and and prevent that kind of incitement from from taking hold and spreading through communities, but also on the alt platforms. And this was where you started to see a lot of the messages as communities were kicked off of Facebook. Uh, some of the more uh, inflammatory Stop the Steal groups were kicked off of Facebook, and they found a new home on Parler where they began to push out that content onto Parler, which had kind of an avowed um, you know conviction to not moderate. Uh, and so that's where that, you know, some of the the question of where to plan and how to plan, you know, the, there are a variety of tools available to folks on the internet now, and these groups are using all of them. And so the question is right now for us, um, how do we think about the relationship between the various media ecosystems, the ways in which these echo chambers form, and then the view of the internet as a holistic system where just because an action is taken by one platform to moderate, uh, doesn't mean that it reduces the demand or the desire uh, to to consume and act on that content going forward. And I think I will turn it over to Alex now uh, to talk a little bit more about um, platform actions. Thanks, Renee. Um, so as Renee said, a lot of actions have been taken since January 6th, and so much has happened that I, it would take, we could have the entire hour just on recapping. Um, what I want to talk about is just some of the interesting questions that are raised and some of the things we should look for in platform action in the future. So first you have the deplatforming of the president of the United States at the point, Donald J. Trump, um, from the major social media networks, Twitter and Facebook, which then followed with this long tail of sites that you generally do not consider social media, but have some kind of user generated content um, and that decided that they weren't gonna support him, um, as well as things like infrastructure components such as payment processors and the like. So this has raised hackles around the world. Even world leaders who have repeatedly asked the social media companies to be much more aggressive in their content moderation, um, kind of asked to pump the brakes a little bit on this as they as this demonstrated the power of a handful of American companies to effectively deplatform a, a world leader from democracy. And, and this raises a bunch of interesting questions because Trump, uh, as I'm sure a Professor personally will talk about, is not that unique. Uh, globally, uh, as a elected autocrat, as somebody who was, uh, you know, elected democratically and per the rules, um, but then used uh, had autocratic tendencies uh, and attempted to use his power to stay in power. Um, the most uh, obvious examples around the world, probably, of uh, other leaders like that who are now uh, very carefully eyeing Facebook and Twitter um, would be uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil and Narendra Modi in India. To uh, populists who have successfully used American social media companies to bypass their local media, um, and in both cases have, have fermented violence, especially in India, um, that has led to much more violent outcomes, or at least a larger number of deaths, um, than we saw on January 6th in the United States. So the application of these rules around the globe is going to be a fascinating question. 
Um, the other thing that we've seen is this massive fracturing of the right-wing ecosystem, uh, where you now have a couple of different things going on in parallel. You still have a large number of people, a huge percentage of the Republican Party, that believe the election was stolen. Um, and their sense of grievance continues to be fed from, in different varying degrees, from professional uh, uh, you know, people that you would you would hope would have journalistic standards, such as uh, primetime hosts on Fox News, through uh, the much less organized um, but more extreme conservative influencer sphere, um, of which is a very interesting space now that you have people who, uh, what we've seen over the last couple of years, is that because of uh, YouTube, Facebook Live, um, to a lesser extent, uh, Twitter, TikTok, and Snapchat, these individuals are able to create audiences that are the same size as say the daytime audience of a major cable network, but without any of the journalistic standards that usually go with the responsibility of having millions and millions of people watch your stream in real time. Um, and while the production quality of these folks have increased, you also see from the other side, these extreme cable networks, uh, most specifically OAN and Newsmax, who are trying to get to the right of Fox News by repeating things that are actually factually untrue on air um, in a way that even Fox has been reluctant to do. Uh, and they are, while they are cable channels, are also becoming more online in that those shows are packaged up for social media companies um, and that all of those individuals who work there are also social media personalities. So we have this kind of really interesting confluence of you know the traditional conservative media becoming more conservative and more extremely online that the same time that you've got influencers who have only had online presences become much more professional in their presentation and build larger and larger audiences. Um, and that overall ecosystem continues to drive the sense of grievance uh, among supporters of Donald Trump that things were stolen, um, that uh, Antifa was behind the Capitol riot, that this whole thing is a frame up job and the like. Um, and I think we can expect that that will continue to exist and possibly get worse. And then to the the large background of, of that large number of people being alienated and angry um, and lied to, honestly, by this uh, ecosystem, you have much smaller groups who are trying to organize violent activity. Um, and these are domestic extremist groups uh, that I'm not going to give them uh, any amplification. Um, we, you know, one of the things that's interesting here is we do have to be careful to separate out the relatively small number of people who are in organized violent groups and to not let them speak on behalf of the entire crowd. One of the dangers I think we have of this moment is allowing what might only be tens of thousands of people to speak on behalf of 70 some million right, Trump voters. Um, and that that is one of the things that we already have started to see in kind of the media and social media environment is the conflation of these two things. Um, and so one of the things that we're, we're, is going to be interesting to watch is one, how do the companies continue to enforce or strengthen the election integrity rules that they created, disinformation rules they created for the election in the post-election environment. The whole idea of these rules was it was a temporary thing, right? Uh, and Renee and I were part of this election integrity partnership that SIO put together with our partners at the University of Washington, Graphica, and the Atlantic Council. We have a big report coming out in February where we'll talk about all these things. One of the big things that we did, uh, and you can still read about it at eipartnership.net, was take a look at the platform policies, which got significantly stronger as we got closer and closer to the election. And now that it's over, there is an interesting question of what are they going, are, are they still going to treat this as an emergency situation in which there will be much more aggressive moderation, fact checking, and enforcement of rules against even large accounts? Or are we going to go back to a normal where this all becomes part of? of kind of what is ex considered pl uh, acceptable political discourse. Um, and I think the former is what is going to have to happen. I think going back to the idea that these uh, crazy theories, especially the ones that are tinged with violence or about individuals, such as people who have worked for voting machine manufacturers and the like, that going back to a world in which that's considered reasonable discourse is going to be have really negative effects for our democracy. Um, and then the second is, how are they going to handle the much smaller groups? Um, and there are already rules around this. Uh, all of the big tech companies, especially with the emergence of ISIS in 2015, 2016 online, created new sets of rules around dangerous groups, organized groups. Now, these groups Groups are very different uh, in, in, in structure and their use of the internet from the Islamic State. Um, and so to see how those rules are applied is going to be really interesting. But what I expect we'll see is, is probably pretty aggressive enforcement from the handful of companies that are part of what's called the GIFCT, that's a global internet forum to counter terrorism. Those are the people who really got together to work on ISIS. It will be interesting to see whether GIFCT is repurposed for domestic terrorism as well, for information sharing and the like. But unlike in the ISIS world, it is 
not illegal to provide material support to some of these domestic groups, right? Being a member of the groups is not illegal. They are not designated. And so while it was very difficult for somebody to run the kind of official ISIS website, to run a website or discussion board that is trying to host uh, the organization of domestic extremists um, is still a, a legally, if not protected, at least not being enforced against move in the United States. And so you're going to continue to see the separation from the companies that are trying to go after the groups versus those that aren't, which is not something I think that we have actually a good history of or a demonstration of what's going to happen there. Um, and so I, I hope that we continue to have strong enforcement from the companies and that the inevitable political backlash that will come from when you do this kind of content moderation, you will always over moderate. Um, and the fact that there is a, a large number of, it looks like mem at least members of the Republican House caucus um, who are supportive of at least the basic ideas here, that the political pressure to stop that moderation does not get to the companies, that, they, that the executives of the companies insulate the teams who are trying to figure out how to best deal with domestic extremist groups. Back to you, Kelly. Alex, thanks so much. And would love to turn now, um, uh, Daphne, to you and then close with Nate. And then also, um, we'll go ahead and put up in the, the chat box links to the report you mentioned, Alex, from the Election Integrity Partnership and a few other reports that have done a great job of documenting what the platforms have done. Um, Daphne, do you want to jump in on, on now what can be done here and what is likely? Sure. And Alex set me up very well there. Um, so my colleagues have been talking about how we got here and what various actors could or should have done differently in the past or could or should do differently in the future. And that prominently includes everything from media companies like Fox uh, to social media companies like Facebook. Uh, so I'm a lawyer. I'm here to talk about what we as a democracy could do differently using the tools that democracies use uh, to, to govern what happens, which is to say laws. Um, over the past year, there have been a lot of discussions about changing a core US law regulating online speech and specifically what platforms can and must do in response to their users' speech. This is a law generally known as CDA 230. There have been over 20 bills introduced in Congress over the past year that would amend it in various ways. And there's been a lot of news coverage, much of it um, unfortunately inaccurate. The Times alone has had to run two retractions uh, for <laughs> misstating what this law actually does. Um, but in the proposals that we're seeing in DC, some of which I think will eventually get traction, like I do expect there to be change in this space, th there are two broad conflicting trends. And the two are seen as partisan, but I want to make a pitch that um, at heart they are not. So one trend, which we see more from Democrats, is wanting platforms to take down more user content, and in particular, to take down speech that is lawful but awful, meaning it's protected by the First Amendment. The law cannot require Facebook or Twitter to take this stuff down, but it's bullying, it's pro-suicide content, it's barely legal harassment, you know, it is encouragement of violence that doesn't quite cross the line to be something that the law could prohibit. You know, it's stuff that, that most people don't like and don't want to see. And while we've seen that trend more from Democrats, I think almost everyone across the political spectrum when they go online, um, they don't want to necessarily have to confront all of the worst things that their fel fellow internet denizens have to say all the time. The other broad trend, which comes more from Republicans, is a fear that major internet companies um, have become these sort of de facto gatekeepers over what the Supreme Court called the modern public square, that the places where we go to share our speech and our opinions and our cat pictures and the, and the places where political discourse is shaped and maybe electoral outcomes are influenced, um, you know, these are in the hand of, hands of a small number of companies. That too, you know, while in the US it gets framed as a question of potential anti-conservative bias by platforms, is really something that everyone across the political spectrum worries about and that individuals and groups of speakers ranging from you know, Black Lives Matter to Muslim rights advocates, uh, you know, also worry that they are on the receiving end of biased moderation. So we will get back to this legislative question and these two maybe conflicting trends, um, well, definitely conflicting trends in DC at some point soon. You know, I think most people think that the 
first 100 days window won't be tech focused. I hope it isn't. We have a lot of other problems in this country, um, but, but we'll get back here. And given the events at the Capitol, it does seem likely that a legislative focus might be about speech that is inciting violence. Um, and so I think, you know, those of us who track the legal chatter um, will hear a fair amount in coming months uh, about exactly which speech the government can prohibit under the First Amendment. The answers there come from a case called Brandenburg and some other cases that talk about uh, incitement to imminent violence. Um, Nate is a real con law professor, so you can ask him all your questions about that one. Um, but I, I want to talk about how there is a second order of constitutional issues here, which is once we decide what speech it's okay to prohibit, and we do prohibit some speech, you know, we prohibit defamation, fraud, copyright infringement, et cetera. Once we decide those rules, how does Congress go about outsourcing enforcement of that to private internet companies in a way that avoids a bunch of pretty foreseeable problems? Um, and uh, these problems have constitutional dimension. There are ways that Congress can screw this up that will make a law get struck down by a court. And I actually put up a blog post this morning listing six of them. I, I won't go through all of them now, but one big one is if you take a pretty vague rule prohibiting speech and then you outsource it to risk averse platforms, and if they don't take things down, they know they're going to get in trouble, well, they will over enforce. And the over enforcement, you know, may get people that we don't like today and people that we do like next week. And one group of people we can pretty strongly predict that it will hit is members of vulnerable minority groups because we have evidence of things like speakers of African American English being disparately harmed by errors made by automated hate speech detectors and things like that. So there, there are constitutional problems involving speech, potentially due process, equal protection in outsourcing enforcement to private companies if we don't try to put in place rules to, to prevent uh, these predictable problems from coming about. Um, there are similar issues, and I talk about this more in the blog post, uh, even if what Congress tries to do is not to make platforms take things down, but merely to inhibit uh, how amplified the content is. This is something that Renee has written about, uh, you know, comparing rights to speech and rights to reach, and that this is a useful differentiation when we're talking about how platforms can respond to things. But when we're talking about how the government can respond to things by passing laws, well, they're not allowed to come in and limit the reach of your speech any more than they could limit that same speech in the first place. Um, so th there are just a, a lot of constitutional hurdles here. And, you know, people think lawyers are negative, and we are, but the value in identifying these barriers is to figure out how to get around them, right? If we want a good law, we need to understand the hard limits. And the hard limits are what is actually implementable, like you can't pass a law that a company can't actually put into effect, and what will get struck down by a court. Um, so I will pass things along to my fellow attorney, Mr. Persily, with that. Thank you, Counselor. So I will, um, you, you set me up perfectly because I do want to talk about Brandenburg and about incitement and how difficult it is, both in the law and uh, if you're a platform in trying to uh, regulate incitement. So I'll, I'll, I'll be wearing my several different hats that I wear. I'll start by being a con law person, then maybe be a cyber person, then end as an election law person. Uh, so first, um, let, let me say that, let me be needlessly provocative at the beginning, which is that one of the, the critiques, the sort of offhanded, easy critiques that you see about our current moment and platform policies is to say, you know, what these policies need to be is they need to be clear, specific, and consistent, you know, and the problem is that they just haven't been, you know, as concrete as possible, and they're not, you know, the, the platforms, it depends on what uh, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg are thinking that day, and so it's inconsistent. And, and that's, you know, that's really the problem here that there's no uh, clear process. When it comes to incitement, it's very, very difficult to develop a clear concrete standard, right, that will apply prospectively to any type of situation that might lead to law breaking or violence. Uh, and so it is 
I think inevitable that you are going to see um, some of this discretion creeping in and that it's going to be applied inconsistently to only the worst cases, only the ones that then uh, get news coverage and the like. And so um, while I think that there are a lot of problems with the way the platforms dealt with Donald Trump generally and then specifically here and then also with the, the events leading up to the riots, um, nevertheless, I don't think that I, when you, you know, in my classes, when you try to force people to come up with a standard that would capture each one of the, the sort of speech elements that people think are dangerous, it's extremely difficult to do so. And, and if I have time uh, and if I can share my screen, I want to show people the, the actual Twitter post uh, that explains why they deplatformed Trump and what the content was there. Second thing, now let, let me talk to about the Brandenburg standard and about incitement generally. So first, let's be clear that, so you know, frequently when you study incitement, you, um, you, know, you often start with uh, the, the fire in a crowded theater uh, metaphor that Oliver Wendell F Holmes came up with. Then you move to more refined uh, argument about the clear and present danger. And then you get to the standard that we have today is, as Daphne said, the Brandenburg versus Ohio case, which dealt with uh, sort of Ku Klux Klan uh, speech uh, in Ohio at the time. And the standard there, right, is that the First Amendment does not protect speech that directs or incites uh, uh, and, and produces, uh, and, uh, which is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. Okay, so it has both this uh, sense in which it is uh, directed toward, you know, it's clear that it's going to, uh, that what the intent of the speaker is, and that it's likely. And that last port, part of the test, I think is really important to focus on is that how, at what stage do you know, or think, or, or should act upon the likelihood that speech is going to lead to imminent lawless action or, um, um, you know, violence. And it, you know, typically the cases that we, we have either apply to, for example, you know, these kind of group-based punishments dealing with communists and the like from the middle of the century, uh, or you have discretion that is being vested in policemen on the, you know, at the scene, and then they arrest someone um, because they see the clear and present danger, right? But think about how, how should the uh, Brandenburg test be applied by a platform? What kind of judgments do they need to make in order to really have good forecasts about the likelihood of imminent lawless action? It is almost always going to be too late. Let, let's put aside at least one straw man argument that, that comes up, which is that, well, the platform should apply the First Amendment. Clearly, they shouldn't because that would, be, that would uh, hobble them and uh, it would really make it uh, too difficult for them to go after some of these violent groups. Uh, and so they need to do something uh, more than that. They, you know, the, the, the platform standards on glorification of violence would all be unconstitutional if they were legislated by the government. In fact, you have a constitutional right, um, um, and the court dealt with this in the violent video games ca case, Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association, to, you know, violence um, and depictions of violence are actually protected speech. Now, Facebook, Google, and Twitter have different policies on that. I think that's the right thing to do. Um, but the First Amendment is not going to uh, set a standard that these companies are going to be able to follow. Um, particularly when it comes to the Capitol Hill riot, um, it is difficult to, to identify the speech that was occurring online as, as falling into the kind of clear standard of incitement that we use for First Amendment law um, uh, as compared to what we saw at the scene, right? So, the, the, you know, it became a clear and present danger, right, in the context of the actual uh, protest and then riot that took place there. So they, they lit the match, right, they lit the fuse on the scene. Um, and so that, of course, is not a social media problem. That, that is, um, you know, a typical incitement problem. And even as, as you've seen, and you'll see this in the impeachment trial, that statements by the president are a little bit different than the statements by Rudy Giuliani, which look like really classic incitement and the like. Let me just end by, by pointing to, to show what Twitter did uh, and, and, and to, 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 to put a pin in this problem of how difficult it is uh, to, to actually develop a policy. So if you notice 
the way that that the, the, the tweets that Twitter, this is from the, the explanation that Twitter gave of for why it was deplatforming Trump. So the tweets that they identified were the ones after the fact, right, that said 75 million of great American patriots who voted for me, um, America first and make America great again, will have a giant voice long into the future. They will not be disrespected or treated unfairly in any way, shape or form. And then he tweeted to all those who have asked, I will not be going to the inauguration on January 20th. By any first amendment standard, these would clearly be protected speech, right? It's, it, I mean, they're not even really, um, Aim, you know, by their terms are not inciting anything. But notice the way that Twitter discusses that, and, and, and this is the way we all think about it, which is, well, you have to read this in the context of everything else that the president has been doing, everything else his supporters have been doing. And so the determination that they said is based on a number of factors um, that President Trump's statement that he will not be attending the inauguration is being received by a number of his supporters as further confirmation that the election was not legitimate, right? The second tweet could have been seen as encouragement, right? That the inauguration would be a safe target and the like. All right, um, let me stop sharing here. My point here is that that what you see in, in the deplatforming um, explanation is that you need a hell of a lot of context to, um, to deal with a deplatforming like this or to deal with enforcement of incitement. And it's so difficult to have a policy that won't be sort of too late, which is in many ways what this was, right? It's only after the actual violence at the Capitol that then the clear and present danger of violence is then something that pushed the platforms over the edge. And I'll just, you know, end by agreeing with, with everybody here, which is, you know, how, how do we, they apply this internationally? How will it be applied to Bolsonaro, Modi and, and, and Duterte? How is it going to be applied to um, uh, left-wing protesters and the like, you know, remains to be seen. I think I'll just end by saying that, you know, while there are, have been plenty of um, hiccups and difficulties in the rolling up the Facebook oversight board, that this is exactly the kind of thing that you want some independent body to evaluate how independent or you know, whether they're the right body, we can all debate. Um, but we know that the government for First Amendment reasons is not gonna be in the greatest position to do it, to, to, but to have some kind of institution on the outside uh, to be the arbiters of these things, I think is quite important. That I'll turn it back to the discussion. Great, thank you everyone. And for uh, those in the audience, please go ahead and enter questions as you have them. Um, uh, maybe I'll start Nate, since you've ended there with the Facebook Supreme Court. Uh, the oversight body and where we have a number of colleagues, actually Pam Carlin, I think uh, Mike McConnell and, and others who join this group regularly like John Samples. My understanding is this was just referred to the oversight board, would be interested to hear if anyone has thoughts on how that is going to operate and what, uh, what you're expecting to see there. Well, we know, I mean, they've said how it's going to operate. So, so Facebook referred it to them. They have accepted jurisdiction. It will be referred to a panel uh, of the oversight board that will include at least one American. It will then, but, but the entire board will weigh in on it. Um, uh, and so we'll see how they uh, decide it. In addition to the specific issue of deplatforming of, of Trump, they've asked the board to weigh in on how the, these uh, standards should apply to political leaders generally. And so it really is a critical moment for the board. I, you know, we all wish that they had actually had a series of decisions that had come down before this so that they it could kind of um, uh, get the wheels going first. But there, there are, uh, I think, six decisions that will come out before the, the Trump decision. Um, they have 90 days to, to issue the decision. And um, we will see, you know, they, they, there aren't dissents formally that are, that are supposed to come with these decisions, but there may be discussions of minority views and the like. One of the things that I love about these conversations is the interesting crowd that we get in the audience. John is actually here. I don't know if there's a way to, uh, John Samples is part of the Facebook Oversight Board um, and has a question. So I don't know folks in the background, if there's a way to elevate John Samples as a speaker to ask that. But while we're waiting to figure that out, um, and in the absence of that, we can ask you, John, to type it. Um, a, a question around uh, what you had mentioned, Alex, towards the end about GIF CT and ways for the platforms to coordinate and set standards. There have been multiple proposals 
along these lines, there's the Global Network Initiative doing some work there. The Cyber Solarium, I recall, had suggested a data threat task force for social media. Senator Warner's office has suggested something similar. Before we get to John, good to see you there. Um, thoughts on uh, mechanisms for enabling greater plat platform coordination around addressing these issues. And Renee, this is something you've talked a lot about. Things will pop up in one place and then look at another, but the platforms themselves often aren't incentivized or have the capacity to track across them. Um, thoughts on coordination, would it help? Is it possible? What are the barriers? So, I mean, some of the interesting, you know, important differences here. So like I said, the membership in most of these uh, American groups, and I think maybe all of them, uh, but the, the lawyers can, can protect me, is, is a First Amendment protected right. And so being part of any of these like domestic violent groups unless you're part of the actual planning and execution of a violent act, the membership is, is, is not something that law enforcement either defines or is going to enforce against. And so I think one of the things that has always been that the companies have always wanted is for somebody else to, to draw the line for them, right? And around terrorism, that is easy and that the United States just keeps a list of terrorist groups. Um, and so it is very easy for them to point to, we're gonna use this list. Now there's a bunch of controversy about that. There's been some people who have abused the existence of those rules to try to silence speech, including academic speech. And so it's not a system without flaws, but at least from the company's perspective, it's much cleaner just to have a list. Um, in this case, that doesn't exist. And so one, I think that is a barrier to cooperation because a lot of these problems are just definitional, right? Defining what is a violent extremist group, what is a dangerous group. You know, Facebook and Twitter have very different even terminology for defining what a group is like a white supremacist group or a domestic group in the United States that's that's possibly ter planning terrorist attacks. How you treat those is is just from even from a language perspective is different. And so I think that is gonna be the first challenge um, because if you look at the situations which the companies have cooperated and the two best examples there would be foreign terrorism and ISIS and then also on child safety, key components of those was that you had a basis in law as well as an early decision to uh, to synchronize on terminology and definitions. Um, so it would be interesting to see whether you see GIFCT or another organizational group come out with a definition that the United States would never create. Um, that goes beyond, well beyond American law to determine what is a violent group. If that happens, then there are already mechanisms in place for sharing this kind of information that, that would be useful. Um, again, the child safety world is where most of that cooperation has come from. GIFCT is a, a, a use of those uh, tools, but in a different manner that requires a lot more contextual support and human. Um, but you know, so those those mechanisms exist. What the government can mandate or what kind of mechanism we put in place. I think one of the other things that has always existed is there's when I was at the company at Facebook and and since then a lot of the companies have complained that there are there's no carve outs either in antitrust or in privacy law to allow for this collaboration. Um, and so there is a carve out uh, for cybersecurity cooperation, but not on kind of these safety things. And so you might see that being something that maybe you get some bipartisan support for of the creation of safe harbor for the companies to be able to work together, at least when talking about specifically violent groups or extremist groups that are likely to cause violence. Alex, thanks so much. Um, John, would love to hear your question. Uh, for a quick background, uh, John at Samples is at the Cato Institute. He's a vice president there. He founded Cato's Center for Representative Government. He used to, well, back when in-person was a thing, John used to always come to our lunches at the center and he is a member of the oversight board. Uh, would love to hear your question, John, and then we'll move to a couple others. Okay, I wanna see if, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. So, um... Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm not at the Cato Institute. I'm above uh, Leslie's Pool Supplies in San Carlos. But uh, so my question goes to Nate's uh, uh, statements, uh, which uh, again are amazing. People outside know a lot more about the oversight board than I do. But the point he made was a very good one, which was people are gonna focus on whether Trump goes up or down, down on this decision. But there was this really big sentence in that press release that said that Facebook is actively soliciting uh, policies for leaders throughout the world. What I would like, since everybody here knows a lot about the companies and about policy, I would like to hear what you think that everyone in the panel thinks would be a good kind of policy. And I would add to that because you know a lot about the companies and because the policy recommended is going to have to be accepted by Facebook, right? They can say, no, the decision on Trump is binding, but the policy recommendations aren't. What do you think uh, Facebook would be one, a, a kind of good policy that would be accepted by Facebook, would be attractive and persuasive 
to the leadership there. That would be great to hear all of that from you guys. That sounds like a question to Alex. <laughs> Because he he's the he's the, he's the Kremlinologist of Facebook. Is that why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, but it's also an idea. I mean, tell me your ideals, but at the end of the day, they're going to have to say yes. That's why I threw that in there. Um, so I actually, for a meta issue, I don't think Facebook is a unit that can be used as a uh, that can be used in discussion in this issue because I think there are actually different people there with very different minds. I, I consider the fact that the oversight board is not up and running before the election to be a massive operational failure. And in my experience, the core, the root cause of operational failures at Facebook, there's a bunch of them, but two big ones are one, either technological determinism of people over pivot into technology and it turns out you need more human or more thoughtfulness. That's at least a positive like look forward, try, people are trying to do better and they, they can't. The other is passive aggressive attempts by people internally to gum up the works because Facebook is a very internally based a lot about consensus um, and you know getting everybody on board and such. And the fact that it's taken this long for a company that in other cases has the ability, for example, to you know massively redo a product for competitive purposes in six months, but couldn't get the oversight board up and running to be a demonstration that there are probably people who intentionally do not want to limit their capability, that they want to maintain optionality, that they want to maintain the ability to make these decisions internally. So I actually don't think Facebook is a good unit here. I think what you're seeing is a fight between like government affairs teams, the, the internal policy teams, the people who have to deal with communications, the integrity teams who have to actually enforce probably are of different minds. Um, the outcome I think should be a guidelines that this can be enforced against other democratically elected leaders. I think a ruling that is a Bush v. Gore and has a thing that says this only applies to this case would be useless in this case. Like we really need is how is this and specifically Duterte, Bolsonaro and Modi should be the, the leaders that are kept in mind when, when trying to come up with uh, you know, what, what is a credible call for violence or what are, you know, if, if, if you can't make that decision ahead of time, what is a call for violence that you, uh, a violent act that you can trace back to a leader and what kind of punishment is placed for that? Alex, thank you. We have about 10 minutes left, two questions. And, and John, thank you for that. It's great to see you. Um, two questions I would love to make sure that we get to. So I'll throw them out both simultaneously and just let people chime in where they would like. Um, one that came up from the audience is around data access and how do we ensure that we're able to monitor what's going on on these platforms in the future? Is there any progress there? This is probably a Nate Daphne one and one that we, Nate, spent a lot of time thinking about through Social Science One and other efforts that we had worked on together to try and figure out how you can get data access to analyze these types of questions. Alex, I imagine you and Ray have some to stay here actually too, since you are often able to do these analyses. Um, and then a second question is, what do we do now with these small platforms? As I noted at the outset, we've seen a lot of people as they've been kicked off, and I think you even saw with Red State Secession, them encouraging their 8,000 followers to follow us on uh, Gab and Parler before we get deleted. Um, so how can we, can we monitor these platforms going forward? How can we do so? Is this a good thing? Um, this sort of links into some of the antitrust questions as well. Uh, we've been saying for a long, you know, there have been calls for a long time to break up the platforms. Now you're seeing that happening. You know, how do we how do we feel about that? So um, either one, data access or small platforms, choose your your adventure. Um, if anyone wants to jump in, I think the, the the platform question is more interesting. Let me let me just try to knock out the the data access issue quickly because uh, I've written a piece that we'll publish on the CPC website in a few weeks on proposed legislation to force the platforms, particularly Google and Facebook, to uh, grant access to an independent group of researchers. It is a very difficult problem, right, on how you do this to maintain independence, both from government and from the platforms themselves. But I do think as there's an antitrust component to this, which is that if you're a platform that is that big, you should not have a monopoly, not just on the data, but on the insights that could be governed by that data. But we have to, you know, the privacy issues are real here. And so we need to do everything we can to prevent a Cambridge Analytica. And there's all kinds of other things, um, other, other safeguards, including criminal penalties for any researchers who, who misuse data that we need to uh, think about. But stay tuned, I'll have something up on that very soon. Yeah, that'll be published next Thursday. It'll be in our newsletter too, so for those who are interested. Um, other thoughts on that or do we wanna jump? I, I'm, I'm interested, maybe I could, could I throw this toward Renee? Because uh, I've thought you've, you've um, 
educated me a lot about this in thinking about whether a world in which the, the major platforms are very aggressive and then you have you know a kind of uh, cozy and move to these um to parlors and gabs and that kind of thing how bad a world is that i mean so because one of the big kind of antitrust questions here uh is say look so so great parlor gains traction you know 4chan gain, they, they're gonna have but but once they're off the major platforms that solves some of the echo some some of the the bigger problems about how those major platforms then get larger audiences as opposed to micro echo chambers on those other ones. Um, is that is that, you know, how should we be thinking about that? Yeah, there's a couple of questions. Again, there's the time horizon uh, thing of, you know, what happens in the short term. So we have seen periods where people have created accounts on what we can call them alt platforms um, in response to some provocation in which they felt that they were being censored on a mainstream platform. Right. And uh, there are spikes in account creation, but they haven't to date been followed up by sustained engagement. So account creation is not the only metric. It's the one that is most often discussed in the press because they're interested in telling the story in the very short term. The question becomes, do we see sustained engagement on those platforms? Did all of the millions of accounts that were created, um, do they actively then continue to participate? And so that's something that will be um, that researchers such as our team will, will look to going forward. Um, beyond the time horizon though, there's this interesting thing about um, recruitment and reach versus um, radicalization, you know? So again, yeah. when we think about that, that trade-off of a large centralized platform that has a lot of resources that it can devote to moderation, it doesn't always devote them, but it can devote them. Um, so there's that dynamic of uh, the ability to prioritize moderation and to address these communities. Um, but the massive size of the platform and things like inadvertent algorithmic recommendations uh, have occasionally increased the reach of these groups. So when they move to smaller platforms where there's less, you know, there's less moderation, there's also less reach. It's not as easy to attract the attention of all the other, you know, bystanders, if you will, that are in that digital space. Um, however, what you may see is more radicalization because the diehards are the ones who migrate over and stay active in those mm -hmm. communities. So when Parler came down, um, there was a migration to Telegram, but interestingly, some of the prominent channels that were really being uh, echoed as the Parler version of a retweet that were being suggested to people, hey, while Parler's down until it comes back up, let's congregate here. If you went and looked at them, interestingly, some of the channels only had in the tens of thousands of users, so 15,000 in one of the big ones that was being amplified around, despite the fact that there were 12 million users on Parler. Um, when you looked at it, there was also a remarkable, um, it's very hard to follow a, a conversation on Telegram. So you would open the app and there'd be 20,000 new posts. Nobody is going to scroll up to the top and, and, you know, chronologically read their way down 20,000 posts. So there's certain like infrastructure and design questions that make certain platforms really the preferred place for large groups of people to organize. And what remains to be seen now is the extent to which the alt platforms uh, take cues from those designs and build that that um, those kind of core functions that people want to see. One interesting example was recently Vote, which was kind of the alternative Reddit, uh, shut down. So it was people who had been kind of kicked off Reddit who went to Vote. Vote had some, you know, engagement. There were some people who were hanging out there. It was uh, largely some, you know, pretty egregious content that wouldn't have flown on Reddit. Uh, but ultimately, it it shut down. And so the question is, as we think about these trade offs and over this time horizon, what we're going to see with regard to uh, the persistence of the platforms and the ways in which they grow to provide these these features that their audiences are, uh, are, are getting from the big platforms today. Because I think I do think and Daphne, maybe I, you weigh in on this, I do think that the the removal of parlor from the App Store is a different free speech problem, leave aside First Amendment, but there's a different speech marketplace, speech problem than, um, you know, the kicking Trump off of, uh, uh, as well as, you know, QAnon folks off of Facebook and the like. And that I, you know, especially when, as Alex was saying, that you go down to the payment processors and all this stuff, that then, um, you know, we, we're, eventually we get to a point where where we are talking about banning groups from the internet as opposed to um, taking their content down from the most popular platforms and reducing amplification. 
Yeah, I, I do think it's a different order problem, you know, being kicked out of app stores because there are basically two of them. And, you know, for Android, you can sideload apps, but nobody really does that. You know, so, so the competition piece of it looks very different and the de facto disappearance from the internet piece looks different. Interestingly, someone who might see a problem there is Justice Kavanaugh, who's a really interesting kind of vote and, and swing thinker on this. But to, to the... Um, the question about smaller platforms generally and, and migration to smaller platforms, I think there's another kind of two, two related issues. One is that they are more likely to be dependent on a different tech company to provide, for example, web hosting as AWS, Amazon Web Services did for Parler. Um, and so then they are vulnerable to some other company's decision about you know, what their moral obligations are or, or what pressures they're vulnerable to and going to respond to, et cetera. Uh, another thing about the smaller platforms that people are migrating to is in some cases they're migrating to platforms that are encrypted. And so I think, you know, we will see a lot more pressure in coming years on the idea that, you know, yet another reason why the government might want to compromise encryption and compromise, you know, privacy and security in exchange for law enforcement gains um, is, you know, th that these sort of dangerous American speakers going there are part of the problem or that in we, the EU we're seeing it framed now as like the need for content moderation is itself a reason why encryption has to go. And our, our colleague Rihanna Pfefferkorn uh, writes very intelligently on this topic. Great, thank you guys. We are almost at time. I think this question that you all bring up about where in the stack do we regulate and do we treat these organizations like utilities and at what point is it the, is it the app store? Is it you know further down? Um, we have a couple minutes left. Last thoughts on really the, the what we might see next, biggest sort of challenges, opportunities you all see going forward. Well, I, I'm with Daphne on and what she was saying originally, which is that, you know, how is the content moderation question going to be uh, grouped in with every other tech regulation issue? And so, you know, there, there is the possibility, you know, that we'll see some movement on privacy, content moderation, antitrust, and transparency in the next six months or so. And once once they once you start putting pen to paper and actually having a debate on this, you realize there as as Alex is you know well, well said in a lot of his speeches on this that the trade-offs between the, the these values are um, you know inevitable and insuperable. You know that you ju just have uh, it's extremely difficult to maximize along all these axes. And so that, that debate will be welcome, um, whether it's in the context of CDA 230 or antitrust or privacy or like. Yep, and we'll be having a publication come out next week on recommendations for cyber regulations for the new administration. And, and that will also link to a few other groups who have done really great work thinking about that. Alex, Renee, Daphne, last thoughts? I, I am looking, it is gonna be interesting the debates around this because I, I do think, uh, what's happened since the election is it is now clear to Democrats and Republicans on the Hill that they are actually not agreeing. Everybody says they don't like the tech companies. They can agree on that, but they actually want very different things. Two years ago, I remember uh, when Senator Warren uh, was big about talking about tech antitrust, that she had her tweets were all like approved by Senator Cruz. Um, and that is, it is now clear that they're not actually on the same side, which makes it interesting of whether there's a baseline. And I hope a baseline around transparency, around data access, the ability for people to study what's going on, and then perhaps some spot views. You know, there's so many things, bad things that happen online that are not politically uh, controversial. And so I'd rather, if we're going to have some movement, focus on bullying harassment, focus on uh, non-consensual intimate imagery, AKA revenge porn, focus on child safety. Like there are abuses that are really big deal that are, are not gonna be a political issue. And it'd be nice to see Congress move on those first instead of getting stuck on the hardest issue, which is like, what is legitimate political speech in the United States? Great, thank you. Thank you all for joining today. We are at time. Uh, we've gotten a bunch of questions about, uh, will this be posted online? Yes, it will. We will link to it in our upcoming newsletter and it'll be on our website and so forth and FSIs as well. Um, we have had questions about what is going to be happening in Europe uh, and how those regulations might play in. We are hosting a webinar on that topic next Wednesday at 10 a.m. PST on the Digital Services Act. So Daphne, will be fun to see you uh, again then. 
And um, really thank you everyone for the time here. I know these have been uh, questions that a lot of us have been wrestling with uh, around the role of these technologies in our democracy over the last few weeks and the implications that we'll have both here and globally. So really thank you everyone for joining us and everyone in the audience for great questions uh, and look forward to seeing you all soon.